everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Impact Talks brought to you by CSR Box. Myself, Adarsh, and today on the show, I have with me Ms. Urvashi Prasad. She's currently serving as director in the office of the vice chairman at Niti Aayog, which, as we all know, is a premier policy think tank by Government of India. Ms. Urvashi holds extensive experience of working in the development sector. In the past, she has been part of the core team. supporting the efforts of government of india's first empowered group for managing covid-19 pandemic in india she also co-authored india's first voluntary national review presented at united nations high level political forum at sustainable development in 2017 and has over 150 publications to her credit additionally ms urvashi is a member of world economic forum's expert network and has been recognized as one of the 75 young indian achievers at uk parliament on the occasion of 75 years of india's independence and very recently she added another fe- feather to her cap after being nominated as one of 100 most influential women in india for the year 2023 by business world magazine ms urvashi it's a pleasure to have you on the show welcome to impact talks thank you thank you it's a pleasure to be here Ma'am, so in the interest of our audience, I'm taking liberty to start this conversation with questions relating to your education profile. You have completed a B.Sc. in Life Sciences Genetics from University of Birmingham, UK, followed by an M.Phil in Bioscience Enterprise from the University of Cambridge, and an M.Sc. in Public Health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It goes without saying that you have completed your education from one of the most prestigious institutions around the world notably cambridge and now through your association with niti aayog you are contributing towards bringing positive change in the areas of health nutrition sanitation gender and public policy among others now even though our premier education institutions have proved their mettle time and again and have churned out one of the best minds around the world there still exists a notion in the section of our population that foreign education institutions are better and this is all the more prevalent in the development and social sector related fields so my question to you ma'am is that what are your views on quality of higher education in india in the social sector and do you think that now is the time when indian can stay back to pursue quality higher education in the development sector yeah um so uh, you know uh, firstly i would say that um, when it uh, comes to the development sector um, there isn't you know one uh, type of education or you know one degree um, that you are really looking to get um, you know people of all sorts of skill sets and uh, and backgrounds are uh, you know welcome to and and encouraged to work in the development sector uh so i think uh, you know that is that is first thing which is important to understand um and another very important thing is that you know as far as i see it um what you really you know learn from in the development sector is experience you know on the ground uh so you know you can come with any sort of educational background or any sort of degree i mean my educational background was in life sciences uh, to begin with um and it's you know it's different from uh, the work i do i mean as in the sector is still similar i still work on you know health related uh, you know policies but the precise nature of the work that i do is is quite different from you know what i what i might have studied uh, so the real experience that you gain is sort of on the job um whether you are working for an ngo whether you're working for a foundation um if you get the opportunity to you know work in the government space then nothing like it although i think you should um, you know i think you can contribute a lot more uh, to sort of policy making if you have had some you know previous experience where you are actually working on the ground um because you know if you want to contribute to policy making it's very important you know what actually transpires you know at the ground level you engage with local communities uh, that sort of experience is very valuable so so i would say that um, you know you should look at experience um, and and that could be of varied kinds um, and give that much more more importance than just the degree you know that you that you actually get um, but as far as your actual education goes you know i think now in india also there are lots of opportunities uh, you know even if you want to study something like you know public health or 
uh, you want to study uh, you know any other kind of uh, social sector related uh, subjects um, or even other subjects so there's i think there's a lot of options um, but like i said you you don't need you know a particular degree really to to come into this sector uh, you need a variety of skill sets you know with your ability to uh you know do research your ability your analytical abilities your communication abilities are very important uh your ability to engage with a wide range of stakeholders is very important uh so these are the kind of skill sets that you need uh, more than an actual degree so i think our audience will pay heed which also involves of a very young audience and that's your message to leverage skills over the degree so but now where you are working ma'am you are working at niti ayog and i'm sure you must be working with lot of young professionals and i would like to know based on your experience over the years in the sector how do we think that the next generation inspires confidence and hoping you for the future of india the people who will be working who will be pursuing degrees in india and you know contributing to the development lands landscape yeah i think um, you know young people um, in india um, i think the spirit of innovation is especially very strong um, we see a lot of innovation entrepreneurship um, so i think that whole culture uh, is is very very strong uh, in young people in india um, and and it's being enabled in a very big way with the whole digital uh you know connectivity and 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 you know young people are really at the forefront of that uh, not not just in urban areas but even in rural areas now um you know you are finding more and more people who are actually connected uh, digitally in that sense uh, you know with the world really so so i think you know this combination um of of you know being connected um with a wide range of uh, you know information sources ideas both within the country as well as internationally um and the inherent uh, you know desire and ability to innovate uh, i think both these are very very you know encouraging um you know sort of signs when we look at our young people um and i think that's that's you know what we need to do india still has a lot of young people we are still a very young country um and we still have that you know window of opportunity to you know capitalize on our demographic dividend uh, so we really need to nurture you know our uh, young people and you know give them the right kinds of opportunities um because i think the future is is you know very bright uh, we have uh, you know people who are doing path breaking work in all sorts of sectors you know in all sorts of areas um so i think i think we have you know in that sense a very bright future but of course we have to nurture this talent uh, and we have to give it the right kind of opportunities i think uh, ma'am me working as a, at the field i think i can reverberate to with what you were saying and uh, shifting the gears now towards your work ma'am uh, when i was working with the district administration at amritsar a very senior bureaucrat told me that you know in administration what gets monitored gets done so it was just two words but that you know strike a chord with me and uh, they stayed with me so ma'am working as director in the office of the vice chairman at niti ayog do you relate to this statement and for better understanding of our audience uh, it would be great if you could elaborate on your own role and your scale of work at niti ayog yeah i mean um, you know i think any a uh, sort of capacity that one works in um you know whether you are working on any one program or policy um or obviously you know you're working at a scale as large as a government um you need to be able to assess um you know whether your intended objectives are being fulfilled or not um and and that is where monitoring and evaluation comes in um and uh, and and you know data comes in um and i think that is now an increasingly very important part of uh, you know policy making um, where you know we are trying to get both real time data uh, so you know there is a lot of emphasis on real time monitoring um, you know the government has the aspirational districts program for instance uh, where in real time using technology uh, we are tracking a number of indicators you know across different sectors 
um, and and this is happening, you know, at the level of um, you know various several districts across the country. Um, but we have a dashboard, you know, which which is even publicly available, and you know anyone can go and see. Um, you know, how a particular aspirational district is performing on a particular indicator. Uh, so I think because we want to motivate, you know, the district administration to take quick action, um, we also want to, you know, capture data in real time because, you know, you can't wait for months and years uh, to get data, you know, if you have to uh, take action today. Uh, so that is one part of the emphasis we have when it comes to, you know, monitoring and evaluation and data is real time monitoring. Um, but then we also look at, uh, you know, more systematic evaluations. And that is something that the Development Monitoring and Evaluation Office, uh, which is an attached office of Niti Ayo, uh, that also focuses on evaluating, uh, you know, schemes and programs of the government. Um, to to basically assess, uh, you know, to what extent they have achieved their uh, intended objectives, um, and and also to identify, uh, you know, best practices uh, in implementation, because you know any any scheme or program uh, that is implemented at such a large scale in a country like India uh, by various state governments. Uh, there's always going to be certain best practices, you know, that you can get from from that, you know, in terms of the implementation. Uh, so that is also something that, uh, you know, we try to get from these evaluation studies um, is, you know, apart from understanding what are the future course corrections that we need to make, uh, we also are looking to understand the best practices and implementation. Uh, so, so basically, uh, you, you know, this is a very big part. It's an integral part of policy making. Um, and now with the government's whole focus on digitization of data, um, you know, we're going to see a real transformation. You know, we're already seeing it in some ways, but uh, we're going to see even more uh, of a transformation because, you know, otherwise you have had uh, paper-based records, right? Any, anywhere, whether you whether you go to a health facility or you go to an Anganwari center, usually have paper-based records. Uh, now there's a whole push to digitize these uh, you know, to integrate them, you know, so that eventually we are in a situation where, uh, you know, we can have different data systems which talk to each other. Uh, you know, the data is interoperable. It is, you know, shareable, of course, with uh, due safeguards and, you know, privacy and ethics and consent and, you know, all that uh, has to be kept in mind. Uh, but the idea is that we should be able to, you know, share, disseminate, uh, analyze the data uh, you know, much more effectively uh, at, at all levels of the government. Uh, so that, that is an overall sort of, you know, digitization push, uh, which is being given. Um, and, and I think then we will see uh, even better, you know, use of data in the future. Um, and, you know, it will be able to feed into policy making in, you know, in an even stronger way. Thank you. Muga and Firozpur are the two aspirational districts in Punjab. And I saw how the uh, government of India uh, nudges them to take newer initiatives and to be on par with the other districts in Punjab. And not just in terms of uh, other indicators, but also in terms of very basic indicators like health, like you mentioned, and uh, the real-time monitoring of data. So I'm moving on. Uh, a large chunk of our audience uh, comprises of development professionals. And ma'am, uh, like you, like me, uh, we all are trying to work towards the social development. And uh, 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 so according to you, what are the things that they should keep in mind, development professionals should keep in mind while designing and rolling out a program or restructuring an existing program to achieve best results? Ma'am, based on your experience, we will let you Happy to know. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it all starts with being very clear um, about your objective, you know, so that uh, what do you want to achieve that goal or that objective should be very clear. Um, and, um, you know, then you obviously come to uh, how will you actually go about achieving it? Um, who Who is the intended, you know, beneficiary uh, or, or user? Uh, of, you know, your particular service or product, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to provide. Um, what are the likely benefits 
um, that you know of that will actually um, you know emerge from from the service or product that you provide. Um, but you also need to you know think about what are some possible unintended consequences of what you are about to do, and especially that I think as a development professional or as a policy person is really important. Uh, you know, because uh, we we all have certain objectives that we want to achieve. Uh, but sometimes when you take a policy or program to the ground, uh, there can be some unintended, you know, consequences as well. Um, and which you might not have thought of, you know, at, at the beginning. So it's very important to be aware of this and to be able to um, course correct your program, to be able to make changes to it as it is implemented, you know, to, to continuously learn. Um, I think that is very important because, you know, um, you should never have the feeling that uh, I know, you know, I know what is right or I know what is going to work. Um, because I think the development sector is one which just throws up surprises all the time, right? Because, you know, you're dealing with very diverse communities, people, you know, human behavior is always, you know, very very um, different, uh, you know, from one area to another, culture comes into it, you know, social norms come into it. Uh, so you might think that, you know, this is my policy objective, or this is my program objective, but the way it plays out on the ground might be very different. Uh, so, so I think you should be very thoughtful of that, uh, that, you know, anything that you're wanting to do, uh, what are the intended and the unintended possible unintended consequences? Um, and, uh, you know, an example I always give of this is, um, you know, suppose you want to incentivize, uh, you know, institutional deliveries for, for, you know, pregnant women. So you want pregnant women to, you know, come and deliver in a health facility. So that is a very good objective. You know, that is a that is your intended objective. And that's very good because, you know, you want them to come to a proper health facility um, where it should be safer to, you know, deliver a baby rather than at home. Uh, but a, a possible unintended consequence of something like this is that uh, the C-section rate, you know, the cesarean section rate actually goes up uh, because, you know, when you have to come uh, for a delivery in a health facility, then your delivery has to be scheduled, uh, you know, at a particular time. And, and the only way to schedule it is to actually schedule a C-section for you, you know, and 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 so, uh, you you know, you it's, it becomes very haphazard if every woman, you know, just comes in uh, when her delivery is naturally, uh, you know, due. So actually what starts happening is that the facility starts scheduling a particular time when you will, you know, come in for your delivery. So as a result, the number of cesarean sections happen goes up and, and a lot of those C-sections might not be necessary. You know, they might be unnecessary, you know, C-sections. Uh, so this is a possible unintended consequence, you know, that that, you know, that your policy could have, right? So, and, and you know, this is something that you might not have thought about, um, you know, when, before you actually rolled the policy out. So, so that's these is basically just an example uh, to say that, uh, you know, any kind of policy, any kind of program, uh, there's always intended and unintended consequences. And it's very important to think of both. Um, it's very important to think of the stakeholders who are involved. Um, you know, every stakeholder has a different set of motivations. Uh, you know, you need to use a different set of incentives to engage with different stakeholders. So you must think about the stakeholders. Uh, you must think about, you know, if and how you will use technology in your program. Uh, because technology is not not you know the ultimate end, but it's an important means to an end. Uh, so you know you do have to think about how you know you will possibly integrate technology with what you want to do. So I think there's many elements, but um, it's it's very important to be clear from the outset. You know what is it you want to achieve, who it will benefit, you know who are the stakeholders, and and like I said, the you know the the likely and the potentially unlikely consequences of you know something that you do um, in one of your uh, world economic forum articles you talked about prevalent disparities in india and how through aspirational district program india is trying to bring these eight areas up with up to pace with other parts of the country you referred to these areas as home to 250 million people which is both poignant and striking at the same time uh, Mom, would you like to update our audience and the people uh, 
with the progress with respect to aspirational district program with special reference to human development in these areas and how those that home of 250 million is flourishing currently yeah so um, you know the whole idea uh, behind the aspirational districts program was that uh, you know through better governance um, and and use of technology which i already mentioned you know the real time monitoring um and uh, basically converging resources you know so central state district level um as well as civil society uh, csr uh, you know private sector so by basically doing all of these things the idea was that we can actually uh, move even some of the you know most poorly performing districts um on a whole set of indicators you know whether in health or nutrition or education or you know financial inclusion um we can actually move the needle forward uh, you know for these districts uh, and so the idea was that you know instead of throwing more money behind a problem uh, we actually change the governance approach um and we strengthen the governance approach um and so you know actually like i said you know you can go to what we call the champions of change uh, you know dashboard um it is accessible through the uh, niti aayog website as well um and you can actually see there you know in real time we track uh, how these districts are performing and and uh, you know many many indicators in many indicators these districts have now started doing you know much better uh, than the baseline so you know we we track um how these districts are doing you know compared to the baseline uh, we also track how they are doing compared to each other uh, and compared to the best performing you know districts in every state and across the country so we do a lot of different comparisons um and basically the idea is that we want to nudge you know the district administration uh, in particular to uh, to you know really focus on these indicators indicators and to and to you know converge resources from different stakeholders uh, so that we can you know move the needle uh, on all these indicators so that is really basically the genesis of the program and we have seen a lot of progress there um and and now you know just earlier this year in fact the uh, honorable prime minister um uh, officially launched the you know aspirational blocks program as well so you know his idea is that okay you know now we've seen some amount of success with aspirational districts uh, now can we take the similar model to the block level uh, you know because that is really a very key unit of development you know if you see in a country like ours even a district can actually be very large uh, so so the idea is that we go even more uh, you know localized and we go right down to the block level uh, and we use a very similar approach that we have used for you know aspirational districts uh to now try and you know catalyze uh improvements in various development indicators at the block level so that is really going to be now the next sort of uh, level to which we are going to take this program um and we will continue with the real time monitoring uh, you know focus on improved governance use of technology um convergence amongst different stakeholders you know so all of this is going to continue um but we're going to now do it you know also at the block level and not just at the district level uh, so i think this is in fact a very very uh, important model you know which which india has developed and this is something that you know we can really share globally as well um because normally what happens when you think of a problem you think okay let me put more money behind it um but here we are saying that you know it's not just about throwing more money Uh, but but improving governance you know can can actually make a huge difference uh, and so so i think this is a very very important model that you know we can actually offer uh, to the rest of the world as well uh, said i think uh, the granular granular approach that you are referring to uh, is something that i observed during my previous role at the district administration where i witnessed both the horrors and the response to the covid 19 by the district administration uh, but what fascinated to me and what is in line to with what you said was to see the power of technology not just reaching uh, the district level or to the block level but the village level and every phc level whereby in the form of covid covid portal uh, we enable this country of 1.4 billion 
to tackle the challenge posed by the covid-19 pandemic so in view of that in view of viewing uh, covid-19 as a grim and yet one of the most biggest most biggest disruptors of our age and uh, so how do you think that covid-19 has pushed us in the era of connectivity and technology yeah i think hugely um, you know and um, not just in health in fact in all sectors uh, we've seen a huge leap uh, when it comes to adoption of digital uh, you know technology and um, i think a lot of you know the credit for this also goes to our startups you know and our our innovators um because you know during a crisis um when when there were all sorts of challenges um uh, our startups our private sector you know they they actually came up with a lot of innovations um and and now many of those are actually being used for things other than covid also um you know and uh, we are you know using those innovations for tb and you know we we are using them uh, you know basically private sector in collaboration with the government uh, so yeah covin is of course one big example of that uh, you know where we uh, could use a digitally enabled system to uh, you know deliver i think over 2.2 billion you know doses of the the covid vaccine that that we have actually delivered uh, to our population um so so i think it's it's a very unique system and i think given that this is also the year of our g20 presidency um i think this is a big uh, you know good in that way that we can do you know we can offer this kind of technology know how uh, you know behind developing a platform like covin we can offer it to the world even during the covid crisis we helped a lot of other countries in many ways um and now we can you know use our g20 presidency to sort of you know share this know how uh, further so i think that is definitely one big technology innovation but there were many others you know whether it's in diagnostics use of artificial intelligence you know to um, to arrive at a quicker diagnosis um you know to to screen patients x rays uh or tele icus you know where uh, where you actually have experts sitting in an urban area uh, but they are actually remotely providing advice uh you know to an icu which is in a remote or a rural setting um so all sorts of you know technology leaps we saw uh during this covid period and i think now the focus is really that how do we take these innovations forward in other areas as well you know or either we repurpose them you know for other areas like i said for tb uh, you know we we are trying to use some of the ai tools that were developed for covid uh, to say that now can we use it for tb uh, you know can we use it for lung cancer can we you know so you can because so many of these things you can use for various other conditions um so that is really our focus now that you know whatever digital innovation uh, we saw during this period of crisis um and we saw a lot you know how do we sustain that momentum and um, you know really take it forward now in various sectors you know health is obviously one sector but also in education you know we saw a lot of digital education platforms you know being developed uh, so so the idea is that we now take it to you know all possible different sectors and and we really democratize access to digital technologies you know because again from the government's point of view Uh, equity of access is a very important goal you know we don't want technology to only be limited to people in urban areas or big cities uh, you know we are saying we want this technology to reach all over the country and it has in many ways um, but whatever you know sort of gaps are there we do want to fill those uh, and we want to make sure that there is equitable access to these technologies you know for people all over the country Yes, ma'am. I think ma'am, what you said goes in line with the principles of Antyo there, which is uh, the uh, rise of the last one. And uh, I think, uh, but ma'am, on a different note, I would like to uh, you know ask you that the period of twenty twenty two to twenty forty seven is undoubtedly crucial for India. And this year, like you said, like you mentioned, we are also hosting G twenty presidency, uh, referred to many as Amrit Kal. uh during these 25 years india aspires to grow leaps and bounds and csr box intends to map this journey of growth as an active partner in, in india's development story so in line with this ma'am i would like to ask you 
what is your vision for india at 2047 when we achieve 100 years of india's independence yeah i mean uh, i think um, you know the the prime minister has already uh, you know put it out um, uh, very very well and you know very clearly on uh, you know in through his independence day speech and uh, you know even otherwise um, that it's it's a very important you know 25 years for us because you know like like i said that uh, we still have the opportunity to make the most of our demographic dividend uh, you know we are still a young nation and and um, there's a lot that you know we can get out of that you know in in terms of our workforce and our productivity um, we um, also uh, have uh, an increasingly expanding middle class um and i think that is going to you know change a lot and and mostly you know it will be positive for our society uh, technology disruptions you know you've spoken about we've already seen a lot of technology digital disruptions which again you know if we use them well uh, we we use them properly then you know they can really you know help us leapfrog in so many different sectors um so so i think there's a lot you know going for india uh, we we are very committed on our climate goals um the the prime minister has articulated you know the pancha amrit um which is that you know we are very committed to uh, our net zero you know targets so we we want high economic growth uh, but we want it in a way that it is harmonious with nature uh you know and there is an element of sustainability you know built into that growth um inclusive growth you know is also very important nari shakti is something he spoken about so you know india of 2047 uh, we must strive to be a gender equal society uh, and and you know women should have the same opportunities they should be you know participating uh, in the same way in all walks of life you know as as, as men do um i mean in, in some ways you know women in many ways are even ahead of the curve you know if we look at it in in india in in many aspects um but you know wherever the gaps exist we must strive to complete and you know close those gaps um so so i think nari shakti is another very important attribute you know of a developed india uh, by 2047 um and and of course you know i think uh underlying all of this is uh, a principle that the prime minister put out that uh, india's development will happen when each of its citizens you know participates fully in it it's it's not about the government developing india you know of course the government is there for governance and you know should provide good governance uh, but ultimately every citizen has to contribute um and only when that happens you know will will we truly see a vikshit bharat or you know developed india um as as he's put it and and therefore actually the government's focus is on you know minimum government and maximum governance you know because the idea is that we create conducive conditions uh, for every citizen to participate in the development process uh, rather than you know just expecting that the government you know will do everything because you know that that is neither feasible nor is it uh you know doable so and and definitely not desirable so so i think that is a very fundamental shift um and and you know free from nepotism uh you know society which is for which is based on merit um and and where every citizen has an equal opportunity to come forward and and you know participate fully uh so i think that is the sort of vision uh you know for a developed uh, india and and you know as i said all of us have something to contribute in that you know in in over these next 25 years whether it's you know the government whether it's somebody in the private sector whether it's civil society uh you know development sector professionals you know anybody any citizen and every citizen has a very important role to play in this well message uh, of yours it's a wrap for the this episode of impact talks brought to you by csr box thank you so much mr vishy for your candid responses to one of the most pressing issues in the development sector of our country and like always a big thank you to our audience for tuning in see you in the next one <laughs>